of famous experiments with colour, the scientist and mathematician Sir Isaac Newton comes to mind. But only after Great Dixter fills our thoughts, an English garden renowned for its bold and innovative use of colour and texture. So join us now on a riotous rainbow route, beginning with the iconic long border, where we can find inspiration to use colour fearlessly and charge up the tempo in our own gardens. Pockets of red planting are creating crescendos of colour intensity in a repeated rhythm all along the long border. Red flowers pulse with energy against a lush sea of foliage. Nothing drains the impact of red more than surrounding bare soil, which seems to suck away its vibrancy, so lots of backdrop leafage is very desirable. The layered shape and texture of surrounding leaves adds extra dimensions of interest to the impact of red petals. Foliage with bronze and deep purple tones adds satisfying depth to the colour of red flowers. Red is immediately impactful against green since they are complementary colours and opposites on the colour wheel. But when rich bronze or purple leafage is added, the glowing depth of charm to red petals is enhanced even further. Can a General Eisenhower affectionately known as General Eisenflower, is a dazzling plant choice combining the generous deep bronzy purple foliage with startling orange-red blooms. Over in the solar garden at Great Dixter, a comparison of the impact before and after this canna's flaming flowers emerge is a good demonstration of the power of searing red to add its liveliness of pulse to surrounding planting. Other perfect foliage foils include perennial shrubs, the deliciously dark purplish-black Sambucus Eva, also sold as black lace, and the pleasingly plummy leafage of Cotinus. It's the same principle that makes dark stems and leaves beneath vivid red dahlias so appealing. In early summer, cheerful crimson splashes of ladybird poppies come with their ready-formed colour foil, bearing distinctive black blotches that please the eye with orderly symmetry, set against exciting vibrancy, adding layers of visual delight to each flower. Mixing reds of different heats adds volcanic potency to a floral composition. All colours from the warm side of the spectrum grown together help raise the visual temperature and ignite the brain's sense of excitement, which is why long flowering annual cinnabar with its haloed red hot petals and central golden glow ignites the embers of your heart. In contrast, cool blue and silvery foliage creates a tingling tension between the forces of fire and ice. Silvery plants make reds hover in the space with surreal levitational power. And as light fades and dusk descends, there's a mystique to the contrast as reds become inkier and silvery plants glow with magical internal luminosity.
But there's another important element affecting the way we use, perceive and respond to red flowers. And this is true of all colours, but is especially evident for red. To explain further, let's return for a moment to Sir Isaac Newton. In 1665, Sir Isaac Newton went into a kind of early Covid-style lockdown during the Great Plague of London, returning to his family home where he began to experiment with prisms in his bedroom. His research demonstrated that colour is not not an inherent property of the objects we see, it is an illusion conjured when the human brain and visual system respond to the emission of light by passing white light through a prism. Newton produced the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet in the colour spectrum visible to the human eye. The impact of Newton's experiments reverberated for decades afterwards. In fact, I think it is still quite a big deal at school when you were first told that the colour of your Lego bricks depends on the wavelength of light they emit and you think wait what it still feels as if a fundamental belief you had about the world is suddenly pulled out from under you it is said that the poet john keats lamented how newton had destroyed all the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to a prism but truly it is impossible to reduce the rainbow to a prism because scientific law alone cannot explain our deep connection to and relationship with color the way colour resonates with our memories and emotions. The importance of colour to our sense of self-expression, our sense of belonging and our sense of self. Colours are wavelengths of light and energy and at the same time they are resonant bandwidths of memories, mood, relationships, emotional energy and self-identity. Red, perhaps more than any other colour, can invoke diverse associations and emotions. It is said that a well-known takeaway food chain once introduced a very saturated red into its restaurant interiors only for customers to complain of headaches from the decor. They were literally and metaphorically seeing red. So like most things in life, success with this colour depends on the size of the dose and the context it's delivered in. The gardener and garden writer Christopher Lloyd, for whom Great Dixter was a family home and the garden his unfettered and unconventional laboratory for colour experiments, cautioned that large swathes of unbroken red are aesthetically indigestible, too much of a powerful thing. But if we get the balance right, red is the antidote to bad decor headaches. This is the colour of energy, romance, attraction, seduction and excitement. Those are the qualities we want to harness when using red in the garden. As well as excitement, there is a tangible sense of romance in the undulating abundance and generosity of the long border, artfully nudging its billowing dress hem over the edge of the pathway and unexpectedly welcoming you with soft ivory tones. There is bridal modesty to the gracefully gorgeous hydrangea Kyushu and an elegant porcelain petal dahlia adorned with fluffy carder bees perfectly coordinated with the golden eye. This ornamental garden is also enormously wildlife sustaining and biodiverse. From this initial perspective, gazing over the border ahead, the red glowing blooms are mostly hidden away in their leafy enclaves, revealing themselves only as you advance along. With red roses come cultural associations of romance, the bright flower bowls of Rosa Florence Mary Morse, conjuring images of courtship and declarations of true love. There is a comforting familiarity to a red rose. For many of us, it is the first fairy tale flower we learn to recognize as a child. It has an indefinable tethering to bygone charms and a lost era, a sense of nostalgia, even in the context of a border that became renowned for its groundbreaking and redefinitive approach to planting. The pillar box red blooms are repeated along the border and here it smoulders under the lipstick pink kiss of Persicaria orientalis. We named this chapter the Rules of Red, but there are no absolute rules. Be ruled by the heart.
In June 1520, in a shallow valley near Calais in northern France, there was a lavish meeting between two rival kingdoms headed by Henry VIII of England and Francois I of France. An 18-day festival which involved incredibly elaborate tents, banqueting houses and portable palaces, an occasion that became known as the Field of Cloth of Gold. And entering the High Garden in September, this image comes to mind, billowing tents of glittering gold brocade and the magnificence of lavish Tudor opulence, a rich tapestry of gold and yellow rudbeckia, generous orbs of orange marigolds and petals of Italian silk stitched through with jewels and pearls. The burgundy feathers of Amaranthus stand proud like the status symbol plumes on the helmet of a knight, known as the panache, which is where the meaning of panache as flamboyance or gracefully theatrical style originates from. Great Dixter has panache in abundance. To create a treasure chest garden, heap it with gold, arrange swags and sways of silky colour all around and sprinkle generously with jewels and gems. Admittedly, for any garden to look this gorgeous, it would also need the combined vision, genius, planning, wisdom and energy of the late Christopher Lloyd and current CEO of the Great Dixter Charitable Trust and long-term head gardener, Fergus Garrett. And I'm conscious we are focusing mainly on colour when there's so much to consider like texture, which we will touch on, and successional planting, which is well beyond our scope. And I'm aware that we are amateur gardeners, giving you our personal perspective on one of the greatest gardens on earth. But this is our way of sharing our joy of colour with you and trying to shake a little bit of the Dixter gold dust onto everyone's day and maybe into the spaces we will garden. Green is a soul-soothing and undemanding colour. According to Sir Isaac Newton, the rays of light which produce in us the idea of green fall on the eye in such a just proportion that they arouse a very agreeable sensation.
This is because green is in the middle of the visible colour spectrum and therefore of all colours makes the fewest demands on our perceptual system. The 18th century French Enlightenment philosopher Diderot agreed with Newton writing green is just the right mixture of clear and sombre to please and strengthen the sight instead of weakening and troubling it. Hence the fact that many painters have a green cloth hung near the place where they work, on which to throw their glance from time to time, to relieve them of the fatigue caused by the brightness of the colours. Green is often the backdrop in gardens, the foil for more vibrantly coloured flowers, which are generally the main focus of our attention and delight. But the old rose garden at Great Dixter, also known as the exotic garden, teaches us that green does not have to be a supporting act. It can be boldly transformed into the main attraction in its own right through exciting experimentation with structure, form, texture and the myriad of green shades and hues that the human eye has evolved to perceive. This space is bordered on one side by the former cowshed known as the hovel. The rest of the garden is enclosed by great sheltering walls of yew. The cocooning chamber of green offers an all senses immersive experience, a walk in jungle crammed with exotic looking foliage and coniferous character. Planted lavishly to encourage visitors to fully engage with stepping over, ducking under and peering around foliage. Every drifting scent and gentle leaf rustle seemingly magnified in this enclosed sanctuary. This space is very much the kingdom of flora, but where possible, it is worth gently easing back branches where they obstruct the path. There will always be an interesting vignette to discover beyond. The contrasts of leaf shapes, size and texture and layered plant heights create varied associations from tropical relaxation to more fairy tale spine tingling trees. These diverse elements season the space with visual, tactile and psychological interest.
piquing curiosity with unexpected discoveries such as echoes of the former rose garden, adding to a sense of pleasing playfulness. This garden is constantly evolving. Many plants will be reintroduced in a different colour and textural configuration next year. These beautiful living green artworks are a bold statement and at the same time an ephemeral experience. But perhaps the boldest greens of all at Great Dixter are the dense clipped topiary shapes, such as the bird forms presiding over the peacock garden, providing the thrill of a traditional arts and crafts aesthetic, an example of the patience, perseverance, steady hand and keen eye required for this long prized ornamental craft and raising the chicken and egg question asked of all topiary devotees from present day to Roman times when clipped evergreens shaped into animal forms were popular garden features. Are we shaping evergreens or are evergreens shaping us?